Okay. So um, in my sort of studies, I would divide the urban design process or the which is also applicable for urban planning. Uh, this is the MUP class, right? Um, the processes are the same. The difference is just the scale. So in urban planning, you're looking at city and um, uh, city municipality and also regional scale as the name of the course implies, but the steps are pretty much the same. So you get a project site, you define that project, where is what are the boundaries, what's inside the boundary, then you identify who will be impacted by the project, that's your stakeholders, and then you evaluate the space and identify what are the strengths and weaknesses, and then you can apply your vision or your comprehensive land use plan, and then you start sort of implementing those plans with short-term experiments and then like review and then repeat. So um, I'll just give this, this is, a, this is an assignment from a, from a different class. But basically in urban planning and urban design, the first step is really to identify your project site. Uh, most of the time, if you work with a firm, the site will be given to you or if you work in an office. But in governments, I think it's more likely that you need to find a site for like that particular project. So earlier this morning, some of you, uh, I talked about the uh, Riparian Rehabilitation Project in Barangay Sin Sin, um, up in the northwestern side of Cebu City. So we're that's the site. Um, we're still we're still asking for a map from the MCWD and the local government, but that's really the first step in any urban planning or uh, urban design uh, project. So the stakeholders are anyone or everyone impacted by that project. And then basically, if you um, do you have any kind of, um, oh, before I move any further, for the purpose of the recording, can you state your background? Like, for example, of me, I'm a, uh, I graduated with my master's in urban planning in Sydney, but my background is architecture. So before I studied my master's, I was working in an architectural firm. I know drafting, I know basic architectural concepts, construction, so uh, that's my background. So I know two of you already, but for the sake of uh, this class, can you uh, tell me your background and then uh, uh, what, were, what are you doing? Um, Oh, what were you doing before you took up this course? So anyone can go first. I guess we'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll volunteer Maria Tabalok. Um, I graduated at Siliman University um, as a BSCE mm -hmm. then uh, before taking up a uh, master's in urban planning, I was a project engineer at a firm in Dumaguete City. Mm, okay. Okay, project engineer as in um, what kinds of projects? Uh, residential and commercial buildings. Sir. Ah, okay, so construction, yeah, Ponde. Ah, yes. Mm, okay, so we have the, basically the same background, but like a different way of approaching it. Uh, Nelson, uh, can you tell me more about your background? Yes, sir. Um, uh, aside from architecture, architectural works, I've been handling as well uh, an environmental works for our real estate projects. I was mm. able to com comply a multiple ECCs for Pundo and subdivision for our projects. And then right mm. now, uh, I am helping out my company assisting to secure documents and requirements for our Six Towers condo in Lapu-Lapu and mm. 50 Towers condo in Mandawi for the processing of environmental compliance certificate. And I got also my certificate of green building last year. And then for now, um, <laughs> yes, sir. Then for now, I am the one, sir, uh, help assist to uh, to be able to comply the requirements for the green building of our, one of our project in, Kan in Kandam Kanduman, Mandawe. Then, Kwan, sir, uh, I'm also the project champion for our 15-story condominium. And mm. right now, we are still on processing to pursuing permits for green and uh, EIS while, while EIS while doing compelling requirements, um, reflecting in drawings, to meet the requirements of the Department of 
um, DNR and OBO requirements. That's it. Mm. Yeah, yes, your environmental impact statement. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so do you do the do you do the like do you do the kind of you're managing a team or do you do drawings or what what go on man? Uh, I do a drawing, sir. Yet at the same time, uh, my company uh gi gi kwan ko gi assign ko to monitor some environmental like mm. uh, compliance so you're for ECC for board. yeah in our office, mm. sir. Okay, ako na lang sir ni mo sir Nelson kay mas lagay ko experience ayaw, sir. kesa na ako. Ayo sir, <laughs> dili sa sir, I need some experience uh, a bit, sir. Mm. That's what kuang sa ko ang side kay wala ko ana I have the I have the theory I have the degree pero mm. opyo ka ato yes, anang my my projects a pinakada ko sir na project ikanang mm. hospital lang uh, I was working with a firm there is a Cebu and then yes, I didn't even do a lot of the the anang getting the permits and I think I just drew and then they just built yeah. it <laughs> yes sir but I I have to know concert daghan pa ko kinanglanon may bau and then that's uh that's that's i said before that kanang i pursue urban planning sir because i want to extend my i think my knowledge mm. since kwan i am related to kwan compliance for kwan environmental mm. ah, so that's it sir okay. very good thank, thank you, you sir. uh next we have uh sir elizar sabinai who i know a lot about from maybe it's new to you guys so, uh, sir, can you please uh, share your kanang background to uh, our one class? <laughs> okay. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before, uh, first and foremost, congratulations to Sir Roy no, for uh, uh, a milestone wedding <laughs> last two Saturdays ago. <laughs> well, I guess in this week, I'm sorry, I just got married. <laughs> I messaged him uh, Friday before his wedding. I asked Sir Roy, "Can we? Have, we will be having class but tomorrow." And he said, "No, Ellie, I have a attend to. <laughs> I have a wedding to attend." <laughs> anyway, congratulations, Sir Roy. Mm, thank you, so, thank you. For the information of everybody, uh, I'm working on a non-government organization NGO that promotes livability, livability, livability and competitiveness of Metro Cebu. So my my background is I'm I'm a graduate of public management and economics at the same time. I'm also a member of International Metropolitan Fellowship. We 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 look at metropolitan planning and I'm currently the coordinator for the Mega Cebu program. So we look at regional and metropolitan planning and LGU planning, local planning. So my my focus now is transportation, but I am using my economics background to look at transportation. So that's why parang transportation economics yung uh, specialization na ko. Then, uh, currently I'm working with different local government here in Cebu, uh, basically Cebu City, Mandawe, for crucial projects. When I say crucial projects, that is in relation to livability, like waste management, water supply, uh, disaster, climate change, uh, transportation, mobility, so mga crucial na inter-local issues that I'm working on. So not just Cebu City, but entirely Metro Cebu because I look at competitiveness based on livability. Is my city livable? And if your city is livable, then you're competitive. So mm. it's it's more on human lens, human development lens, rather than structural and aesthetic lens. So that's my background. And good to see you guys and good to be back in school again. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you, Ali. Uh, and then finally, we have Queen Lee. Um, hi, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I am uh, Queen Lee Edreline, and prior to my designation as uh, the OIC of the City Planning and Development Office in Tanhai, um, Previously, uh, I I know I was assigned in the zoning department, so I was able to know the requirements and um, processes for building permit applications and uh, business permit applications. Um, I also get to study some ordinances in the city and as well as mandates from the uh, national government. 
to jive with the applications and for the completion of the uh, building permits and the business permit licenses. And currently, I am designated as the OIC of the City Planning and Development Office wherein I get to be able to plan things like uh, we already accomplished the executive legislative agenda and also the annual investment plan for the LGUs. Now, currently, my, my goal or my goal for my department is to be able to update the CLUP and so that we will have the CDP or the City Development Plan. And from that CDP, we will be able to call out our uh, local uh, investment plan. So that's it, sir. Okay, very good. Uh, so just to be sure, none of you are classmates uh, previous now, except the Queen Lee and the Ellie. <laughs> Uh, Maria and Nelson, were you with me sa Juan? Um, 11.30 to 2.30 class or are you in a different class? I'm not sure. Okay. See, just Appeal. making sure. Appeal ka, Nelson? Yes, sir. <laughs> sorry. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, sorry. So, me medyo na dubli ang tulo. Okay. Anyway. So, Moto, going back, uh, let's see here. Just wanted to know who my stakeholders are. So uh, the way I was taught at Sydney, uh, University of Technology Sydney, is like we divide the different issues of the site or any project uh, into three, uh, basically physical, economic, and social. So what falls under the physical aspects are the uh, location, the environment, what's existing on the site, economics handles, uh, demographics, um, uh, behavior of the kind of uh, population and then um, those microeconomic factors real estate and like businesses how do they locate so those those fall under economic and the social um, last year I would count this as a separate sort of entity but lately I really want to combine both because the social and economic side is really very much integrated much more than the physical aspects because what's happening uh, economically in a area is also dictated because of social factors like laws, the culture, uh, community participation, and of course the behavior of the people in that specific area. So that's why like, I simplified it from the three aspects to just the two. So basically we have the physical aspects, the tangible, you, basically what you can touch, and then the social economic, which is the intangible aspect. So again, combining the social economic aspect into just one, just for like uh, easier sort of understanding, and it's just easier to discuss as well. Um, let's see. Moving on, this is just a quick slide on sort of the two kinds of development areas uh, that we were taught abroad. I think it's also applicable here. We have green, green fields, which are unused, AKA virgin land, and then the brown fields, which is, uh, for example, a used uh, industrial area that is rezoned into a commercial area, something like that. And it's really popular abroad to rezone brown fields to get more sort of uh, use out of them, to maximize the use. And usually it's old industrial areas that are converted into uh, mixed use, resident, mixed use, commercial, and residential areas. So on the lower floor, we have commercial, upper floor with offices and like um, uh, restaurants, some sometimes even like hotels. One of the bigger projects is uh, Barangaroo in Sydney, which uh, I think was started in the early 2000s. I think it's nearing completion already uh, in 2023. I also have like a report here, basically my uh, equivalent to a thesis. I can share that with you guys as we go along. And then this is more for my architectural undergraduates, uh, site analysis reference for architects. And then climate factors, wind, that's more for my architecture students. Anyway, so going into uh, economic factors, one of the easiest or easily accessible data with regards to economics is population. So why do we need to study population? Mostly because that is our kind of part of our resources, the human resources, basically. And they fund uh, government projects through taxes. 
They can also function as sort of the target market for commercial projects. So it's important to know what kind of people are living in your project area. And then for the most part, do we want to know if they will continue to live in that area or are they going to move out? So we can use statistical data from the Philippine Statistics Authority and then tabulate them to see if the population is growing or is it decreasing. And then we can use uh, programs like QGIS to figure out if they're increasing, where are the people coming from? And if they're leaving, where are they going to? So this is important. This is a very important economic factor because that's your target market. And basically, if you're in residential, that's where uh, people who want houses are. If you're in commercial projects, that's your target market. If in your uh, if you're institutional, like schools, that's also your target market. And government uh, institutions will also follow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so uh, I did a quick tabulation of Cebu province. And then as of, uh, I think I need to update my data here. I, had, I only used 2015 data. So we have Cebu province is now, I estimated back in uh, 2020 that it would be about 3 million people if the growth rate maintained. We can actually double check that now. So let's look at Cebu province population. If, the, if my data is accurate. So let's look at 2020. 3,325,000. Uh, so let's see if my estimate was near. Oh, it's, uh, it's, e it's even less. I have here 3,105,000. So the growth rate even increased further. So that's good news for economic development in Cebu province. And you can, I'll teach you this process, basically a uh, very simple equation. Uh, you can just find it online. Uh, and then also another thing we need to look at is uh, demo, uh, with regards to demographics is the population pyramid. So over here, this is just very basic uh, economic stuff. If you have a more triangular population pyramid, that means your population is growing or is still young. And this is common for developing countries like the Philippines, I think also Indonesia, Malaysia, so most of the Southeast East, South eastern uh southeast asia countries we, meanwhile in developed countries like the us uh, australia japan you'll have more tapered down pyramids so it almost looks like a block so this means there's an even spread between older population and younger population this can also mean that those who are born in that country or area stay in that area because the numbers are basically the same like uh, from 15 all the way to 60 years of age. In the Philippines, we have larger, uh, a larger population base for people 15 to 20 years old because they're growing up here. But when they get to 60, 50, something like that, it's either they die or they move away. So in developing countries, not a lot of, um, let you call this, uh, I guess we can call them older people, like 50, 40, like mature people stay probably because of several factors relating to equity, uh, job opportunities, stuff like that. So th this highlights that there is uh, room for improvement, um, not just in the economic sector, but maybe also the um, physical sector. Like maybe there's not enough housing, maybe housing is too expensive, or maybe there's nowhere for them to live comfortably. So that's why they're moving away to the more developed countries like US and Australia. <laughs> okay, so what we'll be dealing with in this class is specifically, uh, there are two kinds of economics, microeconomics and macroeconomics. The focus of this class will be microeconomics, which is the study of what will likely happen when individuals make choices in response to changes in incentives, prices, resources and our methods of production. So what we're looking at here uh, in layman's terms are buyers, sellers, and uh, small to medium business owners. So within our local communities, our cities, those are usually the, the players in, the, in microeconomics. Meanwhile, just to define it, macroeconomics handles uh, national and even international um, Policy. So it's a branch of economics that studies how overall economy, uh, how overall economies uh, behave, 
the market systems that operate on a larger scale. So macroeconomic studies, uh, phenomena such as inflation, price levels, rate of economic growth, national income, gross domestic products, so that everything else like on a sort of a national level. And then of course, the more popular uh, economic theory, the supply and demand also holds true in both macro and microeconomics. Basically, if you've heard the, you have the phrase already, uh, the price of an object equals uh, is, what do you call this? Directly proportional to the, uh, what do you call it? To the, I'm trying, I can't even say it properly. So price of a, uh, for example, quantity, let's say housing is uh, directly proportional to the supply. And then what do you call this? Uh, no, direct and then inversely proportional to the uh, demand. So if if supply is going up, oh, sorry, it's inversely proportional to supply. So supply is going up, uh, price goes down. And then is if demand goes up, uh, price also goes up. But if demand goes down, price goes down as well. And in this graph, we'll go into it a bit further in the next slide. You can see how demand moves. Uh, Basically, a shift of the demand curve going right means an increase in demand. Uh, meanwhile, if it shifts left, it means an increase in uh, de a decrease in demand. And meanwhile, supply can also shift left and right, and that will also increase or decrease the price. And also, quantity can also move independently from um, supply and demand, and that also affects the prices of whatever goods and services are being offered. And then over here on the lower right is just a simple graph to remind us the relationship between households, businesses, and government. So households provide labor and payments to businesses. And then in, uh, in the same way, income and goods and services are what businesses provide to households. The government provides services and payments to both households and businesses. And then the uh, businesses give tax, goods, and services to the government and also households give taxes and labor to the government. So um, a healthy uh, economy means that all three of these like groups are kanang, providing an equal amount of goods and services and they're also getting uh, compensated. Okay, so here's what I was trying to say earlier. So the law of supply and demand states that if all factors remain equal, uh, quantity, demand, supply, the higher the price of a good, the less people will demand that good. Basically, the higher the price, people won't want to buy it, meaning it's more difficult to obtain. And then, uh, for example, the higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded. And then the law of supply states that quantities will be sold at a certain price. Uh, the higher the price, the higher the quantity supplied. So if people uh, want more of that quantity. It's uh, could be a housing, could be a, a product from a business. The businesses will be incentivized to make more because they want to make a profit. Okay, so we can sort of see uh, in these two graphs how um, I'll just take a screenshot. There you go. So I can like use a blackboard, or in this case, paint. So in the first graph here to the left we have a demand that shifts downwards or uh, down left, basically. So let's say we have original price is at point P1 and Q1. So let me just highlight that. I'll use yellow so it's separated. So the original price of a quantity or object is here in uh, where P1 meets Q1. So this is price one and quantity one. So what happens when people don't want that object anymore because it's too expensive? So there will be a shift in demand going left. This means demand is decreasing. So what happens when the demand curve shifts left? You notice that the price also goes down here to, to where P2 and Q2 intersect. So this is the first price. Let's say this is uh, I'll change to a color that can be seen purple. Let's say this is 20 pesos, and then it ship, if demand goes down, it shifts to maybe like 10 pesos or something like that. Meanwhile, 
if a demand of a quantity, let's say, for example, road space or um, uh, let's say shampoo or whatever, whatever good you can imagine, if the demand for that uh, quantity increases, the price should also increase. So we have the original price here. I'll just change back to a green would be a good color. I'll make the size of the brush bigger. If it starts here at P1 and Q1, if the demand increases, meaning it shifts to the right, the new price will be also increasing up here. So let's say it starts out at five and then it becomes, uh, the value becomes uh, 10 pesos, something like that. Now, um, one thing that's very highly in demand in the Philippines or in Cebu in particular is kanang road space. But it seems to be no one is, I think we're paying through taxes, but road space is such a high demand. But I think there's a missed opportunity there to sort of get the most out of it. But uh, we'll discuss further on that. For me, um, I think there should be, there's some way to cap for the government to capitalize on that. But I don't think um, people would be too excited to pay more taxes than they already do. But anyway, um, if, for example, they start taxing uh, roadway use, for example, they tax, um, if the government will tax private vehicles, that will increase the price of owning a private vehicle and that will decrease the number of people who wants to own a private vehicle but then and then hopefully that will reduce the number of cars on the streets but that's just like an example i'm not sure i'm not saying that the government should tax but like that could be an example of reducing demand and some kind of um a very loose example of how government can incentivize people to behave in a certain way through um taxes or the pricing of a good or a service. Anyway, continuing. So this is basically uh, another example. I'll print screen here. What happens if supply of an object increases or decreases? So I'll just put that on here. So we have the original price of a good, let's say the price of a motorcycle. Let's say here it starts out at P1 and uh, quantity one. Let's say there are, uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, that's the after, sorry. The original is here, Q and P. Let's say there are 100 available supply of motorcycles. Let's say motorcycles with my mouse. And then the supply of the motorcycles decrease. What will be the impact in price, uh, in the price or quantity? So. Let's see, the supply decreases, obviously quantity decreases, but because uh, price is inversely proportional to, uh, quant uh, to supply, the price increases. So if you move the uh, supply curve to the left, meaning a decrease in supply, the price will increase. So because there's less of an object, people will be willing to pay more of it. Uh, give if, if only if demand stays the same, if the demand of that uh, quantity stays the same. Now, in the next graph here to the right, what happens when su supply increases and demand stays the same? The original price here is in point one, uh, P1 and Q1. If the supply increases, the demand stays the same, the price will go down over here. So meaning increased quantity will reduce prices if demand remains the same. And then decreased quantity will increase prices if demand stays the same. Now where this gets tricky is that sometimes both supply and demand change at the same time. So this is where, this is how sort of economics becomes very kind of unpredictable in real life because it's not, it's never constant. Uh, it's either, it's never kind of supply stays the same while demand changes, and it's never demand stays the same and supply changes. Both are changing at the same time in real life. So it's very difficult to sort of pinpoint, and we can only estimate based on like uh, historic precedents, 
uh, what, what happened before, we can say it will happen again. And then uh, these two laws interact to determine actual market prices, but really for us to foretell or forecast what the prices will be, we really need like a lot of experience and a lot of, uh, I guess, um, it's very kind of hit or miss. So we can only estimate the closest uh, uh, based on like historical um, uh, data and sort of how we how we sort of uh, estimate people will behave or react to the changes in prices and supply or something like that. Anyway, so where does uh, urban planning uh, focus? Uh, I think. Most of the time, urban planning and urban design focus on the real estate market because it's the market that uh, talks about land. And then the definition of real estate market is uh, the land along with any permanent improvements attached to it, whether natural or man or man-made, so including water, trees, minerals, etc. So real estate is a class of real property that includes the land and everything permanent, permanently attached to it. There are five main categories of real estate. So that's residential, commercial, industrial, raw land, and special use. So uh, you can invest if you're interested in uh, land or by directly purchasing or like uh, going through a real estate investment trust. <laughs> so REIT, -E if you're like interested in that. So um, we'll be looking at um, some historical data of prices of houses. I don't think we will have one as clean as this, but I'll do some research. And then we'll also have some readings on the topic. And then other things or other tools uh, we can use that are available or resources that are available online. We have property market reports specifically for your local community. Um, I'm not so sure for those uh, communities outside of Manila and Cebu uh, where we will get uh, where you can get property market reports. I guess you can just use like uh, newspapers, maybe if you have anyone who works in real estate that can also be a resource. But the ones I found mostly target Manila, Cebu, and Davao, basically the largest like, urban areas in, uh, in the Philippines. And usually these property market reports will tell you what's, uh, will have like a situationer, basically a page or a report that says what's currently going on and then what are their forecasts. So I got mine here on the lower right for colliers. And this will be interesting for those who work in offices who are uh, looking to construct residential uh, residential communities or focus on um, commercial like uh, housing, hotels, supermarkets, and maybe advise your or consult your bosses, like this is what's happening. So maybe that will be useful for you. And I can show you where to get these uh, documents but um, basically i just search for real real estate reports philippines and then just start got got data off from there so we have here a report from colliers this was in 2020 for residential projects in cebu they forecast that the demand will more or less stay the same from 2020 to 2022 for this is for residential projects and then if you're in cebu i can say it's kind of true I don't see any increase in um, demand for residential units, like the newspapers already say. Um, it's It's been the same. Then there's been a demand for about 7,000 units, their estimate. I think that sounds about right. The current supply uh, from 2019 was about 2,900 units, and they estimate that will go up to 4,700 units. And mostly what's leading this sort of... Uh, uh, incentive to build more housing supply is not the demand, but the price. So you see here, their estimates in 2019, 2020, and to 2022, the price is increasing from, let's see, Colliers projects a slower 3% growth in 2020 prices as we factor in a slower demand from end users and investors. The prices should grow at a faster pace in 2021 and 2022, on the back of a recovery and residential take up. And I think that is accurate. Um, I think people are still willing to pay for quality houses, especially if they can afford it. Okay, 
here we have for uh, a report on office uh, buildings or office uh, office use. Uh, demand is uh, going down in contrast with uh, residential residential units is from 2020 again. So uh, the first half of 2020 supply is down. The estimate 2020 is also down, but they really they're optimistic about the recovery post COVID, which I think is happening right now, uh, 2023. And they estimate that demand will increase for office units. And that will also uh, go together with an increased supply of office space. So from first quarter of 2020, basically no new office supply was created because of the pandemic, because of the lockdowns. And then they're expecting uh, a recovery rate uh, post pandemic to like sort of uh, incentivize people to start constructing again mostly because demand, they believe that demand will still be there. I think it's still happening. In Cebu, we can already see a lot of like new buildings being constructed, or if they stop during the pandemic, they continue construction today. And then here is a property market report from Ayala Land, but um, this just highlights their total revenues, expenses. The more interesting data is here, it's like, how many it shows how many square meters of malls did they complete from 2023 to 2019 so let's see here uh total malls uh gross land area or operating gross land area under construction is 334,000. uh i think that's uh in square meters like total and then we have an increasing trend for ayala malls so these are their uh, supermarkets. There's an increase as well in office space, but they do, I couldn't find one for 2020, so it should be available by now. Increased demand for hotels and resorts, and then I'll just skip the social factors because that's for another class. But anyway, let's see here. Going back to the syllabus, those the basic concept that really comes up is really supply and demand. And then we have a reading here from um, IEDC and Bingham, which should be available to you if you click the link on your modules. If you go to modules, go to reading materials, uh, it's still 3.30, maybe we'll spend, um, I don't know, how much time do you need to read? These are uh, 10 pages for IEDC, Introduction to Economic Development by uh, the International Economic Development Council. So this is a reference book uh, back 2006, but I think we can still use it. It goes into further detail, better than my slides. And then we'll also need to review uh, Bingham over here. Uh, just download it and rotate. This is uh, what the definition of economic development by Richard D. Bingham. And this was written in 2003. I think it's still usable for us today, uh, mostly because we don't really have a choice. So this is the content. Oh no, that's the wrong file. Bingham over here. Ah, yes. I think I need to rotate this. I don't have official Adobe, so I need to get a separate file. How about we spend uh, an hour reading this and then we'll discuss at 4.30 and then um, we'll have like a 30 minute discussion after that and then we'll break and then we'll come back next week and do the next topic. Is that okay? Because uh, I'll stop recording here.